I, I think that's one of the hardest things for me to grasp that you know, I have such a relationship with space and time, the sort of totality of them, like the efficiency of using them informationally. And then I look at how humans have spent their time. It's just like I, I can't reconcile how much life potential is maybe the better way to say it, where it actually hits me, like has been wasted. And, and um, I think I used to lay that at God's feet and, I, and I've gotten better at understanding that that's not the right way to, to view that. And that's a huge, huge thing. Like I think, again, the personal burden is nothing compared to the, the non-local burden of, of what's actually going on. And well, that's the thing, right? Cause it's God who's being abused. Yeah. That's the actual point. Yeah. Like, Mm-hmm. You can't. That's the that's the thing when people try to do the whole like problem of evil and lay it at God's feet as if it's God's fault. It's like yeah. I mean, maybe maybe you're God if you're worshiping a small God, but like if you're talking about the real thing, that's a pretty tough deal because not you're you're trying to like it's like you're you know it's like you raped a child and then you're like, why are you letting bad things happen to good children? <laughs> like that's pretty much what because because like. Man, it, it like hurts to say it that way because that's such a but it's the only way I can get close to saying it because you were talking about that. How did you say it? One half of your life is is like creative and the other half is more like speaking to wisdom that you learn. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, I feel kind of drawn two directions. You know, there's a part of me that needs to create um to to deal with life i feel like that's like the personal side of me coming out and expressing some of what i've encountered and like it, it feels like it's almost already so real that i have to put it out in the world that's the creative side of me and then sort of the more wisdom side of me feels like okay but there is a deeper battle going on here it's not just my soul that i'm fighting for there, there's something else going on and i feel drawn to, to to learn and teach from from that place in my life you know, Oh, interesting. Is there like a connecting point at the bottom? The way you were talking about it, because like in the in that first that creative act, there it it sounded like you like just the languaging of it. It sounded a little more like individual, like I'm sort of getting this stuff out, in me out into the world. And then on the other side, it felt more like this sense of collective recognizing that this stuff you're putting in the world is play is being caught up in something bigger. Absolutely. Yeah. I think it's sort of like a bottom, a top down, bottom up kind of process that, that loops around there. And like, it's so satisfying because they feed each other in a certain sense. Like it's, um, you know, it's been really interesting finding my energies align in certain ways that cascade upwards instead of downwards and, and how useful that's been uh, for me. I, I feel like it's, you know, I, I always talk about the body and the mind, the union of those two things, but I do feel like I had like two separate lives that was feeding each of them individually and i'm moving towards a place where they're the same life process the same person you know is is encountering both of them that's yeah much more rewarding yeah how would you okay how would how do you think of like the mind mind body do those map does that analogy map to these the creative and the wisdom for you or do you see them as on or is it completely just a separate dichotomy well, I did, yeah, I think that was kind of my, my problem before was that I was separating them too hard and I was kind of feeding, you know, I would go into mapping mode so readily with the wisdom and the philosophy stuff. I still do that, but it's, you know, the mapping is laying out the problem and, and working on my ideal self without actually actualizing that. And then, you know, kind of making up for it in another area of my life where, where I was um, basically doing the opposite, right? And really feeding that side of my, my personal self. Um, but leaving the ideal self a little bit outside of that area of my life as well. Yeah. So it's it's sort of the enmeshment of both of them as one that is uh, the newer thing. Yeah. So like you started like building yourself, but they're building yourself stretching apart. And yeah. Like, we talked about this before. Together. It's sort of like the weight of wisdom in a certain sense where you're you're actually making things harder for yourself by improving your ideal self. Because it's actually the distance between the two and how they see each other that is what you're feeling. And so I think that like I had a real refusal. I think we resonated on this, like a refusal to lower ideals, um, which is a beautiful thing. It's really great at producing North Stars and really clear maps and things like that. But 
you are putting that on yourself. Like, and we, we've spoken about that, right? It's oh yeah, it just closer to God practice. in theory, you can feel so much further in practice. Yeah. Oh, totally, totally. You know, I find it, it's so interesting actually, because like, I find this for myself very much the, the last the last year really especially since my daughter was born has mm. has been about that and there's been some really intense suffering in that time for me yeah to just see the the gap between what you can imagine yourself to be and what you can summon a given day you know? yeah yeah and then and but also like to um i think part of it too was that at times i would watch myself my, my like actual live self sort of almost measure up to it mm -hmm. and then went and then you know then when i wouldn't it would just it could just throw me into a tailspin like that's been my thing yeah. for a couple of years now it's like you know for a while it was just it like both seemed to align because like my ideal my ideal self had was so empty and vacuous. Like actually part of what part of what started me on this journey was realizing that I didn't have an ideal self above me. And right. So yes. my life sort of felt meaningless because of that. And so first, yep. like as soon as I started to build one, my my actual life started to get better too. And those those paralleled pretty good for a while. And then like at some point, you know, around I don't know, when it, when things really started to land for me in in the philosophical space with after I picked up John Rubeke's language and some of those things it was like this went way up here, and so mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. It's it's a fascinating journey where like you can really you can really hone your ideal self to a level that isn't touching your your real life, and that's something that um, I know I just got my caught up in. I got really good at being awesome for like a couple moments or something like that, like. A, like I, I, it was really silly. Like a consistency was really bad, but I could peak super hot, and I was using that as a way of like feeling good about those peaks. But it was at the end of the day, I was I was experiencing most of the time a pretty big dissonance with what I wanted to be. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, totally. And also, the drops are dizzying. Like, yeah, the more times you do that, and you drop back in, and you're like, oh wow, like I just can't live with this yeah yeah okay so like what did it like at what sort of what sort of made that shift for you because i think this is a question that a lot of people have right is because i think if you just sort of choose to stay in that space forever i think maybe that's i don't, I don't understand really the term spiritual bypassing i've heard i've heard it used in different ways mm -hmm. at different times but yeah. this feels a little bit like it at least in my experience where it was oh, like yeah. dude i can come across as darn near enlightened now and then mm -hmm. but you know i don't experience myself that way by any means and then so anyway i feel like if you just kind of continue down that track you get to whatever spiritual bypassing is um i don't know if you agree with that but I, but either way like what sort of turned it around for you where you were like okay i need to not i need to switch my my strategy here yeah, I really think it was, you know, the relationship between truth and love for me. And this is, you know, talking about the hemispheres as well, pretty directly. Like I changed where I placed authority in my uh, system of processing my own process. Mm. And it became this, this thing that was promoting honesty over a more external version of the truth or a more, mm. a truth that didn't entail self change. And I think that is always going to be false because of how the information separates itself. But mm. I had an obsession with truth that made me really good at improving my ideal self. And I had a, I guess, a desire to already be what I knew I could be that was so strong that that actually was the way in which I was hurting myself. So it was a, a weird thing where my ego kind of flipped sides and started attacking um, the other direction in order to stay alive. It, 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 but it was a very useful process to do it as well. So not an <laughs> ultimate resting place, but uh, yeah, sort of switch. Yeah. switch I really actually, you know what it is? I, I feel like I am my body as a primary instead of my mind. And that primary secondary relationship, that is tr truth and love. 
So yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah, because it's it like it seems like and it's it's what I'm hearing another way of saying it is like it feels like you're dropping down a level in in truth. Mm -hmm. Like that sense of tr the truth being like a true line or an an arrow flying true. Right? It's it's a different sort of thing than what we usually mean by what people mo what we mostly think of as truth, which is a re a you know corresponding set of propositions to to circumstances, and it's like yeah. dropping down yeah. into space where it's it's more it's more it's more complex. It's a through line. It's a it's a it's a it's a consistency of pattern. Yeah. Yeah, and that's like a, a place you can find and like reliably do as an internal motion. And that that's the mm -hmm. coolest thing to me about all of this is that it's not in, you know, I don't like it to get too caught up in the academic stuff sometimes. I think people are just chasing each other's words around the page and they're not, yeah. you know, people are refusing to look at the system that's right there a lot of the time and actually get into it. But um, one of the phrases I came up with recently that made me think of, made me think of was the notion that truth is uniform. And so, you know, it, words just get like kind of cliche over time. And oneness is something that I think means so much if you grasp it, but it's so hard to touch that because it's so overused and, and often given this code of meaninglessness that I don't think belongs, but that's how our culture has treated the word. But, but truth being uniform speaks to what you're talking about there for me, where you can actually, once you grasp that, internally you can follow that thread from the subject and the object uh more losslessly at least and actually have an understanding of what you're viewing and how you're viewing it um that doesn't compete but actually enforces how you can understand the moment in relation to it because you see what you're doing to the moment if that mm. makes sense mm. i think so it's like a, it's like, it's, it's sort of like a conformity, like a conformity of knowing, right? It's like, you know it because you're fitted to it. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's truth. It's truth, not as, and not as anything, but proper fittedness. Yes, exactly. And it produces an alignment or res resonance within yourself that you want to empower. That's, that's how I view the ideal self. It's like, what version of myself would I actually grant my whole potential to? And I think this is a physical process mm, that mm. you can feel your, I think we are like a, a potential actuator on some level or identity mm -hmm. is, is that negotiation with God and reality, mm -hmm. how much uh, energy we're going to grant ourselves mm. based on how we, how we feel about different versions of ourselves. Oh, interesting. Based on how we feel about different, wait, say more about that. Well, so it's sort of like, I think the reason why fundamentally the superposition is between your ideal self and your current self is because what we are is the coming to the moment or the insertion of our self as a process in the current moment. Mm. And that insertion has a volume and a rate of energy. Mm. So, so it's actually our potential literally being activated based on what, how we feel about ourselves. Um, but it's sort of the confluence of how all of ourselves feel about each other that determines both which which of us is in the seat of consciousness and how much sort of influence we're granted. So we sort of king ourselves and then determine the laws through which we distribute our energy. Okay, okay. So I think I'm Sorry, following just you. a bit abstract. No, no, it's good. I think I'm following you, but I want to. Okay, so I, it's it brings up to me something that I've I've been thinking about a little bit, and I'm I'm gonna let me try this on and see what you think, and I see if it resonates. Yeah. Um, I've been asking the question for a long time, like who am I, right? Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I've noticed as a way to sort of trace a through line between all the various me's that show up is to imagine, um. Imagine a sort of, I don't know, I guess I picture it like a ton of TV screens all around, you know, in, in a mm -hmm. in a sphere around me. And it's like each individual screen or pixel or however you want to visualize it 
is a version of me. And that gets turned on by a certain set of corresponding stimuli or whatever in the world, right? So it's like, but mostly people. I was, I was thinking more in terms of people. Mm -hmm. In a sense, what we are is a is an amalgamation of what happens between us, between this body and yes. the other body when we when we spend time with each other, right? And yeah. and so it's like there's a version of myself that only exists in relation to my wife. It never shows up anywhere else. It can't show up mm -hmm. anywhere else. And so yeah. on and so forth with every other person. And it, so it's a this is a lot of screens, right? Um, yeah. But one of the things that happens is I can. So, so I can identify with one of them particularly, right? Or, and we all know this feeling, right? You, like you go into a situation with a person, a friend, maybe you're at work or whatever. Let's use a job, right? Like I go to my work, I'm a physician assistant. I walk in the door, I, I introduce myself that way. I live in that role. I come home, I drop it. I can go in and out mm -hmm. of that one pretty easily. I, like I don't, I never yeah. talk to my wife like I'm a physician assistant, right? And like, <laughs> but um, at least mostly, I think. Anyway, yeah. But like, <laughs> but if I don't leave it, if I don't actually leave it, then some of my energy gets stuck there and turns it into a mirror. And mm. now when I go, when I go into this one over here, after I'm home with my wife, there's some weird like diffraction pattern that throws this off. Right. And the more of them I attempt to hold on to and like turn on when they're not actually activated, there's mm. a distortion that comes out of wherever it is activated. And so um and so the ideal situation would be that whenever one turns on none of the others are on and all of mm -hmm. the all of the actual energy available to whatever the self is could just sort of fit itself fit properly to whatever the stimuli to whatever's actually on yes and it would do yeah. so if everything else is turned off does that is that sort of resonate 100% yeah, so so I would describe that as like I view the body um, or you know our left right hemisphere as sort of like a field of subjects. This is the Idris net idea that you were just talking about. Is yeah. you can think of a field of objects as sort of how the you know we, our thinking mind works. But I think what we are fundamentally is like a field of subjects that all relate to each other, and you know we are the through line of all of them, but. Mm. The clarity of the connection between each subject is actually what determines the quality of connection that you have to your own energy. So that you actually empower oh, yourself based on the the quality of connection you grant yourself, given the form and your perception of that form, and that oh, that's it's a resonance. Yeah. And this is why the only thing that makes sense is loving other people because you turn them on more. Yes. Because the more you turn them on, the more you actually get turned on, and the more actual like reality gets turned on. Exactly. And, and actually, because of the divide, you're, that's actually what that's why love is what lets you slip the system, because you actually then can take on the role of the um, objective subject instead of the subjective subject. Um, it, and this is where this is where, like, man, the knowledge of good and evil is so damn tricky. Right. The, mm -hmm. the like the third temptation, the third temptation is so hard because we're mm -hmm. like it's it's. It's in, it's so unbelievably challenging to bypass what seems to you to be to fix a situation. Mm -hmm. Like if it's if if there seems to be an answer to a problem in a relationship, it is especially when it's really obvious. Yeah, it's the the temptation to just fix the thing instead of love the person is so extreme that we like i mean everybody's trying to fix the world right now yeah like if we'd all stop trying to fix the darn world it'd probably be fine <laughs> yeah like i know just, what you're saying like you make people like, into problems with that mindset right and, and that's oh my gosh yeah which is the whole problem that they're actually seeing themselves that way and we're just constantly taking the external side this is something that's been messing with me a bit because i've been thinking like what an identity, a default frame identity is, is really actually an imposition by the culture, by the community on you. Uh, I think that that is 
the truth of it, that we're actually formed externally and have to yeah. reform yeah. internally. And I don't yeah. think, you know, I don't think we're even at the level of engaging with that reality right now with what's what's going on. I think that's right. I think that's right because I, I, I actually believe that you only ever see yourself through other people's eyes. This is mm -hmm. part of why this is part of why it's so important who you surround yourself with and who your friends are. But mm -hmm. because and I, and I think it's actually like technically the truth because you're way too complicated for yourself to keep track of. And so yeah, it's like when when other, the way other people react to you is how you internalize, like that's how you get your meat. Mm -hmm. So that's why they were so, you know, hyper focused on attention and literally validating each other's existence and identity through um, gaze matching and things like that. I, I, yeah, I think we are actually much more like a uh, kind of um, hive species than, than we realize. And we do have the ability to to not be in a certain way, but by default, we just straight are. Like uh, the more you look into it, the more it's just like, yeah, this is just culture redefining the software of humans through language. And that, oh, man. that's just what we do, you know. Personalities are even like Darwinian competitions on some level. It's yeah, yeah, interesting. yeah. But yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, it's crazy, right? Because like this is where the whole, you know, hyper-individualism of today's moment becomes so absurd. Yeah, and I get, I get to some degree, I get why it is because it's like, a, you know, it's 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 a exaggerated response to the negatives of uh, of tyrannical collectivism, which is a monster. Tyrannical collectivism is a horrible absolutely. thing. That's absolutely yep. a bad idea, right? You can't no have, individual you can't have, matters. That's yeah, cool. exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> so that's not the answer. But like, neither is this wild individualism because like you actually can't mm -hmm. imagine a person by themselves. Like there actually is no such thing as a person without like without other people, even if you try to make them up in your mind. <laughs> they which, don't even which, form. Yeah. yeah, which, yeah. Like, unless, unless, you know, as soon as you ask yourself a question, well, how would they know that? Or how would they, anyway. But mm -hmm. it's also never been found in the wild either. Like, mm -hmm. you, you've never found, there's never been a, just a single person living somewhere. Well, we right, actually just don't even develop right because they found in orphans like if they if they just don't give them um, nurturing at all they just they don't they don't bother to turn on and come into form like creating an identity is is a, a, takes a lot of energy to do and you have to have kind of constant reinforcement from others like what's valuable what's worth paying attention to and they've shown that like we, we literally just stay a container uh we don't become a person without others yeah that's brutal it's brutal I read this book. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. That it might be. A, you might have read it. Um, Alone with Others by Stephen I Batchelor. I think I've heard of that actually, but I haven't read it. It's good, man. It's a. It's this short. It's a short little book. It's. It's called uh, Alone with Others: An Existential Approach to Buddhism. Oh, cool. And um, it might have made me a Christian, which is funny, but. <laughs> <laughs> that's interesting but <laughs> but um, <laughs> the arguments were so bad <laughs> <laughs> no i think it's just that i already was a christian and it revealed it more to me. um sure that's always how it goes right but it's mm -hmm. um one of you know one of the fundamental premises is that to be a human is to be fundamentally inextricably and completely alone mm -hmm. while at the same time being utterly inextricably and completely with others yeah and that there are ways and generally not acknowledging which is <laughs> what's that sorry it's a, just an and generally not acknowledging that which is right. uh, another right. layer of madness but yeah. yeah 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 um but it was amazing right because i especially when i read things like that that really hit me I, I sort of just take time to sit with it and phenomenologically just explore within myself like Oh, what does that feel like? Is that how does that land? And like, that was one that just oh man, like it it just it 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 as far as I can tell, it works right. And like, mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I noticed, I had this profound sense of relief. I had, I had the mo one of the most profound senses of relief that I've ever had because I realized that like I 
one of the chief strains in my life was an attempt to fully get those to bleed into each other. Hmm. Like to fully, like the desire for someone, anyone to truly know who I am, like hmm. in and out, like to actually know me the way I know me. Yeah. And to have somebody else sit in front of the, like the scintillating heat of all of that and be like, yeah, you're okay. Like that, mm -hmm. you know, and then I like, and then of course I realized like, that's the whole idea of Jesus. Um, but like, <laughs> yeah. but, and, and so that was really helpful, but, it, but first was just the relief of being like, oh no, that's actually how it's supposed to be. And you're not supposed mm -hmm. to be able to get a hundred percent of either of those. Yeah, it does, it does touch on something for me though, that like, I, I'm resonating with what you're saying, but maybe speak to why there's such a burning desire to be understood because for me, there's always both of that. I think like part of my, you know, interest in, in wisdom in general is actually to express the side of myself that I feel I wish to see more of in the world. Right. And so I feel like we, we do understand that it's impossible on some level to actually be grasped by others, but I would be lying if I wasn't saying that's clearly part of the motivation for what I'm doing. And, and I feel like mm. I've always been obsessed with like root consciousness because of its shared properties with others. You know, I'm actually mm. trying to reach for a global uh, function when, when I'm exploring mm. in order to resonate. Yeah. So I don't know what, what you thought of that. Well, I think what that brings up to me is actually a really important distinction. I'm, I'm like grateful that you brought that up because it, it seems like, but what I feel in response to that is like, yes. And it's, it's, I think it's a matter of like, which mode of being known. Cause I think it was a mode of like totality of specific experience. Mm. It was what was calling out for the witnessing versus what I hear more when I hear you talking is like a totality of resonance of soul. Or something mm. like that, like like some sense yeah, of like, yeah. like, like, like your soul is truly known, not what your soul has been through, because what your yes. soul has been through is not the point. The point is how that changed your soul. Exactly. Yeah, and I, I do feel that way. I feel like I'm trying to point at the, the universal, you know, what is there rather than point at the what i am in light of what is that that i, I feel like becomes the message in most of culture mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah but I, I do think there's like a, a genuine aversion like what i experience is like a true attraction like almost obsessive focus on the more fundamental you know, effectively kind of systemizing the human process is what I'm doing a lot of the time. And I noticed that that is distinct from, um, like others seem to run from that place. They don't want to view themselves as a process. Mm. I mean, yeah. I'm losing my way here, but I'm, I'm just trying to say like, I don't understand the not having the need to understand myself would be maybe the way to actually phrase it right and i just i i i genuinely struggle with interacting with the world because it doesn't seem like many people are that interested in understanding themselves and that's what we've always resonated is that like you're you're clearly you're you understand the spiritual path is is to become on to the degree that we can the objective subject and to share in the beauty of, and the goodness that resonates with that and I feel like that, even as a project, has been so absent from the world that I, I grew up in, lived in, that, like, yeah, it does feel like I need to heal that side of human community. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's, yeah. It's interesting. Okay, there's a bunch of different things that pop up for me along there that's really interesting. <laughs> interesting <laughs> places to go. Let me just pick one. Um I'll speak to the part that seems like it's most important. 
in this context, which is, I agree with you, like watching other people live their lives and especially when they're suffering and they know they're suffering and like, especially when it's their own choices that are making them suffer and they know that mm -hmm. um, and seeing them not even show curiosity about why they continue to hurt themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, that's the biggest that's the place where if i'm hearing you correctly where where i really feel like don't you yeah. aren't you curious about this and then you know because that's just that i mean that's the littlest inkling of what you're talking about you're obviously talking about a higher aspiration than this but i'm talking about like that's the that's the place where for me i think it got started yeah and well, that's when we have an upward cascade of curiosity but and i actually always assumed that was quite fundamental but it's been one of the sadder realizations of my life to realize that it's much more common to have a downward cascade as a reaction to curiosity, um, generally speaking. Yeah, yeah. There's a different animating spirit there that mm -hmm. you can get caught up in. But yeah, I, it's... I think that is the empowerment of ourself that I'm talking about with the spiritual. I think like caring to care at, at some fundamental level, and like that that drives curiosity on the level that powers our awareness and, and you know, ultimately our soul. Yeah. I wanted to go back to, I wanted to ask you about when you talked about it's sort of the, I think you used the word like systematizing. Mm -hmm. But, but if I hear, if I'm hearing you right, it's basically like a, a movement of what the way I would talk about it and have been talking about it is as if, you know, the, the body of Christ, humanity fully actually becoming to operate as the body of Christ in the sense that in the same way that my various organs collectively operate in a cohesive yeah, um, a cohesive unity that is truly diverse and differentiated, but but comes together with such utter capacity and reliability and self-autonomous function that feeds into a higher order whole that it can produce whatever I am like in that exact same manner that that happens. There's a way for us to come together in all these various layers of culture and all this stuff that we do that can, that can give rise to something that is more than, well, fundamentally what, you know, what we could imagine in the same way that my liver could not imagine that I would be what I am when it, you know, when it agrees to become my liver, <laughs> however that works. Absolutely. Yeah, that, 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 that like drive to be a holistic organism that values the individual and the whole in in perfect balance. Also, I think that's what transcendence is. I think it's a, it's a dimensional integration. It's literally geometry that allows this to happen. Talk about that. But um, I think, yeah, it's just... I. It's very bizarre to me to live in a world where there's no, seemingly no interest in achieving that, let alone, um, yeah. you know, the ability. I mean, yeah, it's it's quite it's, shocking to me. Yeah. It's so bizarre to me because, like, even the language I just used to describe that, right? I think this is actually the Christian vision. Like, I think this is the mm -hmm. point of Christianity, technically. Mm -hmm. And it's so puzzling to me and so interesting and I think this is actually, I'm, I'm still trying to parse out why I remain at the margins of Christi Christianity. I think we might actually go to church tomorrow, which will be the first time in several years. Mm -hmm. So that's the whole thing. But um, <laughs> we'll see if we go back after that. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but the, the question is something like, if that seems to be the vision that Jesus was trying to give us, and even the early mm -hmm. church fathers, and maybe even the early church for a while. I don't know where, you know, who, who knows? There's so many ways, places you could point to and suggest that it went wrong. But if that's the, the point, it seems like we've sort of ended up in the exact opposite point where people, yeah. like, at least, re, you know, it's changing more and more recently. But, like, you're sort of, most of your people understand Christianity, Christianity and Christians to be primarily about separating into two camps and deciding who goes, 
who who goes to the good place yeah. who goes to the bad place. It's just a membership checkbox. And... and that's a fundamentally different kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's actually against the principles of, of the religion originally, right? Where it's that anybody can come. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's where I'm so confused about Christianity because I'm like, how is it that this same thing, like the tradition was good enough to give me this message and actually communicate it with a level of fidelity, you know, that has, I think, helped us to figure it out. But maybe it was, maybe it was because it was like, I mean, one of the ideas in Christianity is the kernel that falls into the ground and dies. And maybe that's what it is. Maybe it's just like, it took us this long to figure it out because like, I mean, we didn't even know how evolution worked until pretty recently. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to appreciate how rapidly we're accumulating knowledge. Like it's easy to look back on previous generations, but they didn't have, you know, anything close to what we have. I mean, what we have is we, we should be very grateful for, for the knowledge that we have access to because it's, it's wild. Um, so I do, I do forget that sometimes, but I am, I am just, I'm just sh shocked that, you know, there, there doesn't seem to be, it does, it does, feel like there's a shame or a, or a hiding of wisdom um you know, avoiding of, of the search even in in society generally speaking and there's a there's a real turn towards surface level things i think it's an active pull like it, for a while i thought it was a neglect but it seems like a really active like don't look there um that's going on in society i don't know i'm, just, I'm getting more grounded in my understanding of some of these things i'm just I'm looking for other people who are like, no, 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 like we know what wisdom is and we have to elevate it. We have to actually pursue it. Um, mm -hmm. It's not naive to understand love the way that spiritual people do. It's that, that's actually naive not to, right? And there's a lot of circles where that will just get you laughed out of the room. But yeah. again, why are we putting intelligence above wisdom? You know, we look at what we're trying to build with AI. It's like, when you understand what humans actually are and what we're capable of, if we were willing to engage as the body of Christ, to engage as an integrated processor, we are like an 8 billion unit quantum processor. And, yeah. and we actually could understand everything. Like it's just, it, it is identity that gets in the way. And when you're talking about the health of your body, that how well the field of subjects are interacting, their interaction quality, Look at humanity, right? It's just there isn't even an attempt to have a uh, functional connectivity there, which is, yeah, 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 can't stay that yeah. way. Yeah, you know. So I want to zoom in on what you said there about AI because, like, I keep I keep having this thought, right? Because, like, you know, John Verveke is making this argument that AIs can be. Like in, in theory, there's no reason AIs can become sort of the full capacity to in, interact with reality that we are. And yeah, artificial life. It, I did listen to your your podcast with him. So. Yeah, yeah. Like I, I if I understand him correctly, that's what he said. Mm -hmm. With actually a significantly higher capability of interacting with reality than us. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. I I don't. I don't know. If I agree with that, it doesn't really matter because I don't have the scientific chops to back up, you know, or probably the philosophical ones to, sure. to really argue with them. It just intuitively doesn't feel quite right to me. But I think the one of the reasons I think that is, is like, you know, I work in medicine, which means my my sense of just the complexities of what it means to be a human, especially in relation to your body, in your embodiment, is pretty sensitive. And so what I notice is like, our bodies are in are are in touch with our environment the environment around them mm -hmm. on so many different planes pro quite a few that we don't know about i'm pretty sure absolutely right? cuz we have all i mean you know we discover things that are you know sort of new you know like when they when they discovered that there's there's what there's like a shrimp that can see in wavelengths of colors that we can't see and do different things. Like they, mm -hmm. anyway, the point is like, there's so many different layers and so many different frequencies within those layers in even just something like touch. 
and and the the complexity of of mechanisms for really really basic simple like processing in our in our biology are massively complicated and complex not just complicated mm -hmm. they're complex right like it's it's a complex system fundamentally this is yes. the argument it's a complex system and we build complicated systems and we i don't think we can build and and even you know that they self organize and this other stuff i'm like it's still based on us it starts off a complicated system and if we're going to embody them unless we can figure out a way to like interface them with biology in which case then we're just going to become one with them or something i don't know how it happens then but like mm. if we're going to try to like put them in robots that we build it's like there's no way you're going to get a robot to have the same level of capacity to actually interface with the complexities of reality that are anywhere close to a human body well yeah not not in a robot body right like i think it gets interesting as you talk about the different ways of achieving this further into the future but what you have in a, in a metal body is just like an inert substance so it's fundamentally numb to its environment mm -hmm. now you can make up for that in some other ways of processing but like what a human body is, is is a constant chemical interaction with its environment and so you can just look at it like just on that level alone on information processing we have so many more dimensions to absorb reality in and engage it, and it forms us too so i think they're actually being built to um, be disconnected from reality yeah. fundamentally. So, yeah. 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 I wonder, I don't know. I sort of just feel like the AI thing might, I don't know, they might just end up being really good mirrors for us to realize, like maybe realize a new layer of humility. That would be nice <laughs> <laughs> in relation to our own capacity. It seems like wishful thinking, but yeah, that, that would be nice. I think, <laughs> I think we're actually going to see the total opposite. I think we'll, we'll actually see full on religions forming around different AIs. And like, I think it will be hubris of, uh, you know, I don't know, human, human has got some pretty good examples of hubris, but we're going to keep doing it. So that's what I imagine will take place. And I think on each of those levels, like I think um, on, you know, technological level, the biological level, and uh, hopefully the spiritual level. I, I see humanity kind of taking those three branches into the future. Yeah, yeah, interesting, interesting. I don't know. I, 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 I want to go back to way back to the beginning of the conversation, but close to the beginning, sure. where I was asking about that that turn away from the sort of spiritual bypassing that we talked about, because mm. I wanted to ask there about what has been. Like, what has been the model for you to follow in doing that? Like, is there is there a, a person, a sage? Uh, oh, like, because what you're getting at there is more than just a, a cognitive process, right? Like, you're talking about an embodied, felt sense, practical. I would imagine, yeah. Like, what does that look like for you to cultivate all that? Hmm. I'll go back a little bit. I do think there was this real sweet spot that happened for me when I learned, you know, basic mindfulness meditation. And then I combined that with somatic practice. That's where the, the realness of my body returned to me because, you know, on some level I'm, I'm actually really dumb. And that's, that's why I've made some problems easier to solve because I've been so, like, so unbelievably disconnected from my body growing up that it's actually a very obvious problem internally once I was willing to look at it. So um, so I, I think I have like a, a good environment for realizing this, I guess, in a certain sense that I haven't taken, uh, maybe taken for granted a little bit, but I think that the reason I, I go into geometry and I talk about us being a shape is because the internal sense for me when I touch that place is coming to a form. There, there is a form that I view as the logos. That's why I always go to space and time because I imagine myself aligning with time as, as we're falling through it in the moment. And that, that kind of wraps me around my own self creation process. So 
it's it, the best word is probably like a slipping. I feel like I'm slipping the bounds of normal reality, finding a higher dimensionality, and then rolling back down and through. And that that's a process that like rolling back down and through is the order of operations in my own conscious process. And mm. it, it is something that I feel like I have the mental grasp of, like there's a virtual clay that I'm playing with as, as I'm doing that. Mm. Mm. And like, as, as you're iterating that it, it allows your, like your, um, your practical self to become more of your, of your ideal self. Is that the, what yes. the process looks like? Yeah, kind of like a, imagine if you want to picture it as like a sort of a reflection pool of the imaginal. And I'm applying sort of cymatic pressure to generate a form that expresses the imaginal that is normally passive in an active form that feels like the highest energy version it could take. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it does feel like I'm taking... I'm assigning all of my passive energy to a resonance with my active energy. Oh, I see. I see. <gasps> There's sort of a completeness of spatial immersion that produces a temporal effect and, and actually slows the processing time down. Mm. And I feel like I'm, I'm actually extending the window with him when, within which I exist. And that oh. gives me more time and dimensionality to play with the processes that I'm running. Okay. Okay. I see what you're saying. Do you do that? Like, do you access that sort of space in a meditation space? Or do you do it sort of like, do you get it up and running? So like you're, you're like walking back to that at different points during the day? Like, what does it look like? Yeah, that was a big move for me when I became like more internally referenced because I think there's part of me that always, whenever I was reading others' words, we, we talked about this before, I don't have an academic understanding, not like putting chapter books in a library. I'm, I'm absorbing it as my own knowledge. Yeah, yeah. And I view this as another step further down that line where it's an internal thing that I'm touching and I know it through the craftsmanship of working it it's, it's, it's a substance that I've worked and I understand um, how to form it because of the time spent, you know, in direct relation to it. And that, and that for me was a big part of why I could start using the word God and, and other things, because I was very uncomfortable with others definitions of some of these things. Yeah. But once I had that internal reference, I was like, I know what I mean. I, like, I know what that is. I know where it is. I could find it. Oh, it's I a see real thing. Now. It, it, so it's just like saying. the internal reference was a requirement for me to go there. Yeah. Is that part of like what you mean when you're talking about? Um, I'm curious about the, this internal reference and you're, when you were talking about sort of knowing wisdom and not being ashamed to yeah. follow wisdom. Is there a, can, can you, is that a relation? Am I right about that? Absolutely. Yeah, that, that speaks to sort of the external pressure on that system versus the internal. And I do think that I had to validate the internal in an environment that what my deep, deepest, truest self was saying was outright crazy and was like, would be ridiculed by society. And I knew that. I've known that for a long time. That's been a big struggle for me because it's hard to stand in front of the whole world and say you're wrong you know and and it, this is doing that at the level of the soul this is saying that humans generally speaking don't know what they are we can know yeah. we can look and find it but you do that internally and yeah. all of culture is a giant waste of time like it's just a giant sea of people distracting <laughs> each other because they're distracting themselves because no one wants to look at this i mean there's yeah. a lot of things you have to engage with to, to get to reality because it's it's not at all what, what we've been told, right? And so empowering that internal view and understanding that this is God, this is wisdom, I know this, and the external world does not. That is obviously a place where arrogance come in, you have to be real careful with that, but it's also 
when that comes from the honest part of you, yeah, yeah, it's a really interesting thing where you're like, wow, I actually need to stand behind what I know of wisdom. Like, these are my highest values, and they're my highest values because I got myself out of the way. Mm. If I'm not willing to fight for that, or like, if I'm you know, there's, I don't know, there's been a part of me that's like bitter about having to engage the world in that way, but I feel like I'm losing that part of it and just accepting the responsibility of like, wisdom is real. This is what it is. This is how it works. We can break it down. Let's stop playing around. Let's actually do what we're supposed to do. Like ancient yeah. cultures knew this better. Why are we so far off track on the most important track? You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, uh, okay, do you... I often feel like, you know, because because I'll I'll have people ask me, you know, like, why why do you why why do you do all this stuff? Why do you read all these books? Why do you know all this stuff? Like why why is it that when mm -hmm. I talk to you, I end up finding myself talking about you know having no idea what's going on? Like, yeah, you know, I have to, I have to first sort of get the shame out of the way of being like, oh no, and anyway, but mm -hmm. but I I find my I find the answer to that question really being like, I don't really know. It's just like I feel like I'm cutting my way out of a spider's web mm -hmm. like all the all the reading of books and all the the learning of people's you know you learn these people's names because you get to know them because you figure out what they understood and what they didn't understand and how they how it turned you all upside down mm -hmm. you know generally they're well-meaning people who did a really good job trying to figure out how everything works and for whatever reason they got a little bit kind of wrong and that sent everybody barreling down a wild track you know and it's like you figure that out and then you're resentful toward them for a little while and then you realize that they're actually well-meaning and then whatever anyway the whole the whole journey but it's like do you think that sort of all of it's just a little bit of a waste of time like when you get to the bottom of it you're like man we just really didn't need to go down any of these paths yeah i think that's one of the hardest things for me to grasp that you know, I have such a relationship with space and time the totality of them like the efficiency of using them informationally and then i look at how humans have spent their time it's just like i, I can't reconcile how much life potential is maybe the better way to say it, where it actually hits me like has been wasted and, and um i think i used to lay that at god's feet and, I, and i've gotten better at understanding that that's not the right way to to view that and that's a huge huge thing like i think again the personal burden is nothing compared to the the non-local burden of, of what's actually going on and well that's the thing right because it's god who's being abused yeah that's the actual point yeah. like mm -hmm. you can't that's the, that's the thing when people try to do the whole like problem of evil and lay it at god's feet as if it's god's fault it's like yeah. i mean maybe maybe you're god if you're worshiping a small god but like if you're talking about the real thing that's a pretty tough deal because not you're you're trying to like it's like you're you know it's like you raped a child and then you're like why are you letting bad things happen to good children <laughs> like that's pretty much what because because like yeah. ah, man it, it like hurts to say it that way because that's such a but it's the only way i can get close to saying it because um yeah. because the way that oh man oh I don't think I've ever told this story to anybody except my wife. Um, hmm. um, I had one time, I had this experience where, so there was this, there was this playlist of songs that would reliably engender mystical experiences, confrontations. Um, that mm -hmm. that sort of blended time blended everything together right the spiritual became physical and the physical became spiritual and on one of the occasions that i was i was i was in this and um i would just play i would play it just in our kitchen in our house i play it pretty loud and i would just stand there and sing and they're christian songs it's straightforwardly christian um and i would be you know just just getting into the music and all kinds of wild things would happen I'd be on, I'd like usually i had a recurring one where i would be on this on, in on this stage and it was like a like a pure white marble stage 
and and around it was like a four-sided amphitheater that went on beyond where you could see and it Mm -hmm. was all you know just bright and you know the notion of glory right and one of the songs actually the song that starts it the the playlist of mumford and son's song and i'd be off sort of on the side of the stage singing singing beside mark marcus mumford because i would you know just sing the songs Mm -hmm. and you know in the middle was like the like the, the the 24 chairs of the elders like from revelation and and in in the middle of that was just overwhelming bright bright light and so that would reliably happen in that space but Mm -hmm. one of the times i like that was happening and i got and then i got sucked into the to the light space Mm -hmm. and it was like i mean i what happened in 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 that the physical world my wife told me was that i like i just fell on my face on the ground just like <laughs> like like a biblical Painted. like yeah <laughs> um and i was just and and it was like the feeling of it was just overwhelming um love and brightness and glory but the most like the most striking thing was the innocence mm. the innocence and the simplicity and the purity and like what what i i don't think i should say like i don't it's it's one of those things that i don't think you should try to put into words what i saw mm. but one of the ways that I, it has to be described was as a child that's not what it was but that that's the only that's to get close to the feeling and and so and you, thomas merton has that that poem about the hagia sophia where he talks about this you know the, and it's like when you realize that it, you know what god is one of the ways that, that god is is the, like the the childlike innocence of perfection that is provided to us hmm unquestioning and completely completely at our mercy and and completely willing to be taken advantage of in all of the awful and horrific ways that we do and then we turn around and we lay the the sins of the world and the evil at god's feet you know and of course the christian story is like as if all that wasn't bad enough, he actually looped it around and came back and took all that back on for you too. <laughs> you know, like that's what's yeah. happening with Jesus. Right? It's not like Jesus is paying off a vengeful God. Jesus is paying off a vengeful humanity. Yeah. To save, to I, save I, a perfect God. I wonder if that's what it is, right? It's If, if love is the key that unlocks this what you're talking about there that that experience of pure innocence of like raw you know the exploration of life almost i feel like is what you're getting at there it's like being a great being you know that itself might be the experience that is lacking um in those that aren't pursuing it like what i mean to say is that you might need to have been touched by the sacred um, experience of love. That's certainly what brought me to to, to my journeys. Mm. And I think about that sometimes. I think like, is it just that there has been an absence of the purest essence that causes that? Because I think once you see it, it is undeniable. Like there is no standing before that You know, later in life, you can definitely walk away from the path. But while you're there, there's no denying love. And and it it does change you what you are, you know, if you actually are having that experience, right? So yeah, that experience is not being had. It's it's the only argument I can come up with that makes sense of the situation. And that's what the institutions of the church are supposed to be. Um, giving to people and, and, and other aspects of society, right? And it's like the sacred is so far. We're so far from the sacred. I think that level is the level that matters yes, more than so, 
the conceptual so right? it's just yeah and we've been trying so like we we thought that we could bring it to consciousness by talking about it but the more you talk about it the further away from it you get because it's an actual because it's it's the lived reality substance of your actual life you can't force it onto your life by believing it right this is where like the trivial notions of Christianity where it says, well, just believe, you know, say this prayer, believe this thing. It's like, I don't know. I, that, that, that probably matters somehow. And it, I don't know if, if, if you need it to work for you to get to heaven, sure. It works for you to get to heaven, whatever. But like, mm -hmm. that's not like, I don't, I don't think that you can think and will yourself into that connection to divine love that you're talking about. I think that's mm. the thing. I, maybe this is what, like, you know, because because Paul and 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 some other people in the in the Bible really give you the sort of sense that there's like a there's a way in which you just, you get chosen for that, you know, and if you, mm -hmm. and that and which which does raise the possibility that there's people that aren't chosen for that, which is an interesting question. But like, who knows? Maybe it's actually just one of those things that like I think we think. God controls a lot more things than like, like we tend to think of God so much in terms of power. Oh, here's, this is an interesting thing. Sorry. Did you want to, mm. did you no, have something? No, you no, say? No. Okay. No. Um, I, I, I was listening to this, like um, Jordan Peterson talked to Bishop Barron and then uh, father Mike, someone. Um, and it, so they're, you know, both Catholics and, Peterson's kind of sort of like an adjacent Catholic, right? Like his 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 wife's Catholic, mm -hmm. so he's anyway. But Jordan asked Bishop Barron the question of like, you know, if, if Jesus if Jesus won, right? That's that's sort of a Christian idea, right? That like mm -hmm. Jesus cross death resurrection, like battles over, battles won, right? Same killed, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Like Jesus wins the day. Like why yeah. why why are we still doing this? Basically, right? It's, he said it more eloquently, mm -hmm. but basically, you know, how what what, yeah, yeah. what are we still doing here? And Barron's response was something like, "Well, you know, there's 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 a real meaning to freedom, and there's a real meaning to the story, and there's you know, there's 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 it's really worth it for us to actually have individuality and free will and to make choices in the world." Okay, mm -hmm. fair enough. I buy that. But I think there's actually a better answer to that question that includes that, but is deeper. And that is something like, it's like, there's, there's a, there's a miss, uh, there's a missed assumption in there, mistaken assumption about the way in which God wins or what it would mean for God to win. The assumption in there is that for God to win would mean that the lion would lay down with the lamb, there's peace on earth, that sort of idea. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that's right. That might be how we win, right? Mm -hmm. But the claim there, if I understand it, is something like God has won. And the way that God expresses his power is not through a forced assimilation into his will. Like Actually if there's one yeah, if there's one yeah. thing we can say for sure about God, is he's not gonna force you to do the right thing because we do the wrong thing. Unless we just mm -hmm. believe that we've never done anything wrong, which that's a tough argument. <laughs> Which, so, like, so, in that case, like, the right answer to that question is that, is to actually change the way you understand God and the way God re re relates to reality. Yes. And that means that God's not in control. Like, he grants you control. That, yeah. that is the fundamental understanding of that relationship, right? Yeah. I think that that humility to, to see that we've talked about it before, but to truly see that, then you have to stand as a human 
who has trod on the face of God. I mean, as an individual and as a species, that's just what we seem to do. And, and reckoning with, you know, being birthed from that pure innocence, being given that, and what we choose to do with it, with the power that we're given and the way that we're, you know, able to control our own power distribution, how we spend our time and allocate ourselves is not as the body of Christ. And, and it really could be, it really should be. When you understand what we are, that is what's happening and we're just turning away from it. And it just gets to this place for me of like, we have to speak to that. We have to be talking about that. Um, you know, we've got 8 billion backs turned to God. Uh, and they're turned, you know, to the internal mirror. It's just, we can't want to keep living in this world, right? I mean, there, there has to be a point where we decide that um, there's a new direction to go in. And it, to, to me, the crazy thing is like, it's not like we haven't been here before. The cynical nature of this through humanity's history is really interesting. Because for sure, there was a point when a lot, you know, a higher percentage of living people, it was important to them to align to God. And I think that they would, yeah. because of that, be doing better at it. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's interesting. Yeah, I mean, there is some. But I don't, like, and then, then you try and have these conversations and people get caught up on what God is at a level that you you can't even engage in the process of exploring it because it's too simple. It's too self-justifying realistically to get there. Yeah. I mean, people have this like terrible idea that you can actually, you know, like that, that God is somehow something that you can have any conversation about without completely sort of taking the guardrails off of your thinking. Yes. And I don't mean that in the sense of like, oh, just believe anything. No, I'm like, you're still going to use your reasoning and rationality. I mean, take the guardrails off in the sense of like, I'm not, I, I mean that conversationally is what I mean. I mean, like, I mean yes. that when you're, when someone else is talking about God, you need to stop asking yourself and genuinely talking about God. Mm -hmm. Don't ask yourself the question of like, do I agree with them or not? Like if there's a, if there's words that hit you, that trigger you just assume that they meant it in a positive way, even if it doesn't make sense to you and just listen and yeah. just try to just try to inhabit the perspective that they're giving you, whether you choose to continue with it or not, it's fine. But like, if, if you don't do that, when somebody else is, when somebody is seriously talking about God, I think that you're just like, it's yeah, you've just sort of made a category mistake. Yeah, absolutely. You're not even beginning to discuss the real con concept or, or thing behind the label there. And I think that's what hurts me so much about humanity is like we've killed each other. And when you, when you look at all of human history, it's just a giant translation uh, error. Like just people not understanding each other at all and thinking when you say this word, you mean this. And it's like, no, we're actually different language models um, that are just like competed on this level that isn't even connected to reality so like all of all of our decision making has been on the surface level and there's been the iceberg under the water the whole time and it, it just it's just shocking to me to realize that like we actively seem to just want to stay above the water more than anything like regardless of how bad it looks regardless the worst thing would be to look at reality i, I feel like on some level we couldn't be here unless that was more true than um commonly admit at least do you think it's do you think it's maybe like maybe it's just as simple as it's actually just the um the process of grace taming the apes <laughs> like because animals are pretty I, I wish we were more other. tamed <laughs> I like, missed my just, there. like oh ah uh, Oh, apes like to kill each other. I think I what I said, but mm -hmm. well, I, I guess I see it also as like the ape is not 
not God's creation, right? So I think I think some people will divorce them, divorce the relationship between themselves and God in either direction. Mm -hmm. And I do think that like we're we're not just happen to be apes. Like I think God instantiated this. Like there's a real reason behind what we are, regardless. Um, even though we have the control from the door on the inside, like he, right. we didn't design ourselves, right? We got here through his vision. And, and I think that reckoning with that, like that's what I get hung up on sometimes, honestly, because it's like we did get this tremendous capacity. We got everything we wanted that you could want, but we hid it from ourselves because to have it, we'd have to acknowledge that we're not the most powerful being um you know that there there's something about the gift that we were given and the way that we rejected it that has put me on this path because it, it just feels like again kind of what you said the sweetest nectar of life and then you just slap the hand spit in the face it was just like doesn't make me feel good about humanity to realize what we we are and what we do with what we've been given. But I really do feel that like when you connect to what we could be, you can't help but feel distraught by what we are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> as, as back to the beginning thing. of the conversation, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Well, I wonder, like, um, do you think we ever did reject it? Like obviously we reject it every day, but in the in that sense, it's like, well, where's the individual self, right? But like, I, I guess wonder. I guess what I'm wondering is like, you know, it it's it sort of seems like I can't, I don't I don't know. There's all sorts of arguments out there, but it like it sort of seems like evolution's got it got something to what it's saying, right? And it's like, well, if that's if evolution's at all correct, and hopefully that's not too broad of a term, but that basically at at the point that that humans emerged and thinkingness emerges and consciousness and the ability to communicate complex ideas and do complex things and tools and extract and you know do all the things that make us so much different than the apes hmm. that that you know that's a, that's a shift that is you know at, at before that the only way that proper you know, an, an ever-increasing complexity of fittedness is achieved is through just a very sort of straightforward physical grinding type motion, mm. right? It's just it's it's just an opening and closing of affordance gaps all the way all yeah. the way down, and part of that involved just pretty you know, like it's just pretty straightforward like animal violence on violence right because they just they didn't have the capacity to process at a higher level than that and now it's like yeah. well now all of a sudden we have a whole layer higher than that to process but it just it, maybe it's just taking us so long to actually like on the spectrum move up to the layer where it's like oh we actually can do this like maybe we never really did reject it in the sense of just like well our ape sort of has been half rejecting it the whole time instead of just being you know, spoon mm. fed grace. <laughs> I don't know. Well, I guess what, yeah, I know what you're saying. And I think like on the individual level, that's true where you could say there isn't an, uh, an objection, sorry, a, a rejection of kind, just a, mm. of content in a certain sense. But right. I think when you look at humanity as a species overall, there seems to be like no real motion towards actually the opposite motion. Like I, I really do view human cultures and civilization as like splitting people from themselves, their own nature. Mm. I don't think it had to be that way. I don't think it necessarily always was that way, but that is what the world we live in today does. It, mm. Humans as a whole make it way harder for individual humans to, to find goodness and to find, to find God ultimately. And I'm yeah. trying to figure out like, that's the rejection that I feel like they, human humanity's rejection of god and and their place well honestly it, it's a rejection of their own connection to their body and and the world so I, I do feel like we just didn't want to pay the cost of being real 
I, I don't know how else to say it. Like, I think that. Yeah. Do you think that's, yeah. um, do you think that's, a? Uh, do you think that's, because it didn't sound to me like you were saying that that's always been the case with like cultures. Mm. And I'm wondering if that feeling is exacerbated by what I would, I would say is actually, I think I could make a pretty good argument that we actually live in an anti-culture. Hmm. Yep. Yeah. saying. And, and like, and an anti-culture that actually I think would be quite happy to hear you say what you just said in the sense of like that we have rejected God. Like that's sort of, that's sort of the guiding. Oh, it sounds like sort of the, that. Yeah. Yeah. That's sort of the guiding ethos of the culture that we live in at the moment. Mm -hmm. To the tune of like, you know, people are doing strange things like putting up Satan statues or whatever, you know, these like, so yeah. you know, I, I, I saw a news story. It was like on a, just a normal, I don't, I don't remember. It was like something about a vandalism of a satanic statue in, in the, in the state capital of Ohio or something. It's just so mm -hmm. odd to me. Cause it's like, and, and we celebrate things like being a bad boy, right? How many, how many mm -hmm. pop culture songs are there about being a bad girl? It's like, you're literally using the word bad. Like, <laughs> if I told yeah. you this was, if I told you this was a bad apple, I don't think you would want to eat it, right? If mm -hmm. I told you this, the milk had gone bad, would you drink it? Like, what do you, like? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like noise is prioritized over signal and to such a like extreme degree yeah, that it's, it's um, yeah. And I wonder or if hard that's to like, 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 does that, is that sort of what you mean about where we're at is like, it, it's it's this cultural moment specifically like at some point we just at some point we made this flip that you're saying where we decided to do an anti-culture that no longer bound us together but actually was fundamentally intent okay let me can i throw oh no i asked you a question go ahead <laughs> well i would just say that yeah like i think it we somewhere along the line felt like we could grasp reality and we rejected its its grip on us and oh yeah okay i see you know so we, we we've it was a two motion, like it was a throwing away of the old way for the new way. And the new way was us taking it to nature, basically. And um, actually has been more successful than, than you might imagine, right? I mean, we've produced incredible technology, but again, none of it has been moving us towards the good. And therefore, we don't actually get the promised fruits there. Yeah. I mean, I, I really think like there's a lot of people... I noticed that so many people do this thing where they say, you know, well, I don't hate modernity though, because look at all the good things it's done. And, you know, it's sort of self-evidently pointed to that, you know, the fact that the fact that I have lights on in here and we can be talking over computer screen and these sorts of things. Like that's actually one of the things. Like, who wouldn't be able to have this conversation right now? I'm grateful for this. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And I, I don't, I don't find that to be self-evident. Like it might actually not be better for us to be having this conversation right now. It might be better for us if we lived next door and actually spent time sitting around a campfire together and plowing each other's fields side by side and holding each other's, mm -hmm. holding each other weeping when our wives passed away at the birth of our fourth child because we didn't have good enough health care. Now that yeah. one specifically that sounds painful, but... Yeah, yeah it might actually be better than what we're doing right now. Because yeah. one thing that working in medicine has taught me beyond a shadow of a doubt is that there is absolutely no, it is not self-evident to say that it is, we are better off as human beings because we can extend our life so much longer with technology. Mm -hmm. that Some of those fighting. later years are low quality. Not only that, that or the, or no quality, or mm. like upside down, just suffering. Yeah. And and but what's so much worse is that we have. The worst thing is that we have totally turned our backs on death because one of the things that you keep talking about here is you know this turning back our backs on yeah. on reality, turning our backs on the connection that reality has on us, and a big part of that is our our sense of obsession with the idea that we could make ourselves immortal we yeah. are so damn obsessed with that idea and it is 
one of the most horrifically painful things we've ever done to ourselves. Because mm -hmm. I spent a lot of time talking about talking to people about their deaths a lot. And it sucks. It's really hard because they like people are not prepared to die. Sometimes mm -hmm. they are, and that's beautiful. But like our collective, uh, yeah, you know, oh man, okay, I could go on for too long about this. No, I mean, yeah, it's just people running from realness and nothing's realer than death, right? Like, I think our lives only make sense in the context of death. And if you live your whole life not engaging in that context, your life made no sense. And you, you get to the end of it and you realize that, you know, if you have a slower death, I guess, and it's it's too late. You know, I think that's one of the tragedies that you probably get exposed to a lot, right? It's, yeah. Exactly. People, yeah. I, I saw it in, in my grandparents with people, and it's like they know. You you can see that they know that they they feel like their life was a waste of time and didn't, but they can't engage with it now. Like they're you you see that tremendous sadness, and you see them just pass the ball on it. And and I found like I you know I I found it very unsatisfying to to witness some deaths that I've seen in my family because of that. It was just like, this is just not, didn't feel like a proper engagement with, with the process of death. And, um, mm, sorry. Yeah. It, but I see that every day. Like I see, I see people that is where my obsession of, of, you know, how does this nuclear reactor of our self engagement work come from? Because I see the, the, the death that comes every day. And that hurts me more than, than the final one. Yeah. 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 And so all that to say, to make the point was that, thank you for, for the whole space for me to, um, um, but all that to say that I don't, I don't know that it's self-evident that, that it was worth it. I think, I think, yeah. you know, Continuing technology, can continuing our power over reality at the at a rate of I don't know I don't I don't know the more careful rate would have been better. Well, but we're so severely headed in the opposite direction. Like we're about to explode our capacity to yeah, yeah. not pursue the good but pursue power and like our orientation is so far off and i think that's one of the biggest things is that like in result yeah sure you can't expect perfection but in orientation in alignment it is actually a good goal to pursue pure goodness yeah, yeah. and yeah, that's a good way the fact that we're not doing that is really really concerning to me i think that um we have to be at the end of the cycle here because there's just not a lot of road left. I think everyone is kind of aware of that. Right? Like if, if we do some of the things that we're on the precipice of doing, uh, we're either, you know, just hitting the reset button, starting over, there's a new game, um, which I've come to terms with on some level at least. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, that's you know, or there's going to be a spiritual awakening and that's the reset of some kind. You know what I mean? But yeah, it's just, we can't keep pretending that we don't know what's going on and in that uh I mean, we're just we're sprinting with our heads down towards multiple cliffs and everyone's just like cool with that i, I, don't, I don't really um i gotta be real in that moment in those it's, moments it's just like i don't know i'm not going over the cliff without at least yelling at the so. <laughs> it's literally like you're on a you're on a big ship that has you know like all sorts of money laying around all over the place and all the people who are in charge of the ship have formed little gangs to hoard all the money. <laughs> and they're all like sort of bickering and fighting and nobody is manning the ship. And there's like, yeah. there's a big iceberg right there. And it's like, and there's a bunch, there's, there's some of us down here who are going, whoa, whoa. Actually, everybody's sort of freaking out, right? But most people are just fighting each yeah. other. There's very few people who are like, hey, we should steer the ship. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, and I think that that's the biggest thing, right? It's like in politics and in, in private, you know, companies and stuff. It's just the leadership is just not there. It's just there's a whole generational failure 
to produce uh, wise leaders. And I don't, maybe it's multiple generations. I'm not even trying to be uh, picky there, but it's just, you know, <laughs> there is no baton being passed. I can tell you that much. We're picking this up from scratch. And uh, I spent a lot of my time like becoming a, an adult, like reckoning with the fact that I don't have an example of, of someone in my life that, um, that feels like a North star. I, I mean, you know, there's, there's people that inspire me. So I shouldn't go too far with that, but there's a real absence of, of leaders that, mm. that I would respect and look up to. And I, and I think that instead of being bitter about that, just being like, okay, that's the challenge of our generation is to start from scratch. We're, we're, yeah. we're not, you know, yeah. yeah. The willingness to embrace that though has been, um, as I'm sure you're aware, like, like a, Again, because like I, I won't put my ideal self down, um, but therefore I have to pay the cost of knowing the gap all the time. I choose that, but yeah, yeah. it's pretty serious sometimes. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's really well said, man. That's really well said. It's really interesting. Like there's, um, it does feel like there was something, I mean, it was like, you know, we had a nuclear bomb of collective trauma dropped on the world with with World War One and World War Two, for sure. Right, like, I mean, we literally dropped nuclear bombs, but also like, you know, the bloodbath of the twentieth century is something that I think we're only beginning to like actually excavate the shell shock from, and the PTSD. Yeah. Right, like, we are so. And 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 our whole our whole leadership structure is a generation at like one generation removed at best from that. Yeah. Like all our most well, for those of us who are, you know, coming into our middle age years and, you know, readying ourselves as next in line to become the leaders of the future. Like mm-hmm. the real leaders, not not we're yeah. not talking about small businesses. We're talking about people who make the <laughs> real decisions. Yeah. Like we are we are looking around and being like, oh shit, nobody's in charge. Yeah. It's like That's people weird. just stopped turning into adults. Like yeah. it's just like a preference for a teenage mindset that That's captured really basically everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody's totally obsessed with high school, right? Like yeah we just sort of replicate college at infinite yeah or college yeah i mean how many people will tell you their best years were in college yeah and then again that's like the, the program stuff like you, i think your culture kind of forms you when you're a young person and when you get older the spiritual journey is your reforming of yourself and we just totally stop sending people on that journey um yeah. i think that it became like you know you're already perfect and it became about justifying yourself it got flipped around right and it's yeah, you know yeah. now your lawn is what matters for your your character for the community like yeah. I, I just yeah i don't know how we got there but it's <laughs> all of society is a giant cardboard cutout and i just want to knock it over at all times and um i like that you like to do that with me. <laughs> <laughs> oh man uh it's just so like it's um it's so funny how like when you actually get a look when you actually take a peek under the hood of sort of systemic evil it's just so gosh darn lame <laughs> yeah it's so banal and like really <laughs> It's it's horrific, right? And it's and it's, yeah, and it's yeah. in the nuts and bolts of it. It's ter- It's just so awful. You, you can't even, you know. I mean, every, yeah. every, we're, we're obsessed with that, right? But like, if you actually look underneath it, what's driving it? It's just so fucking dumb. Yeah. And that's children. Yeah, yeah. It just it hurts, man. <laughs> you know, it it's people not hurt. willing to reckon with a little bit of bad feeling. You know what I mean? Like, oh man. <laughs> Yeah, there's this. I read this book. But they give away book. all of their agency. Like I, I think that it's an unrecognized cost on the other side of that because it's not it's not a trivial equation. They're just treating it as a trivial equation. 
but you lose everything. You lose everything if you don't uh, pursue the good. Yeah, and they do. They do. They always do. And they see everyone around them on the same thing. Yeah, and that's where, like, um, you know, the, the ideas of, like, demonic possession and whatnot it's like mm. i think yeah that, that that sort of idea weirds people out because they have the sort of hollywood version of it right of like somebody right. rolling on the floor floor writhing and i'm not saying that's not demonic possession who knows that's probably you know but those are small fish like if those mm-hmm. if those are demons those are the guys who are just sort of out torturing individuals for fun right yeah but but to be to be possessed by a demonic entity it's like i don't know i feel like i've been possessed by a lot of them absolutely yeah. like every it's time every place. time i take one of those lenses off my eyes i'm like oh whoa <laughs> yeah that's what i mean that's why I, I consider like life on earth hell because it's just visibly clear that most people are demonically captured once you understand what that word means like they're, they're formed they're living out ideas formed by others entirely and aren't pursuing yeah. their own path through life. And that's just what that's what they mean when they say demon, right? It's externally controlled. So yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. It's just so um relieving to connect with someone else who has made the same choices and decided to be real at, at whatever cost. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. um why I feel alone a lot of the time is because I don't I don't get that resonance. And if I show it, people will leave. Like people will <laughs> visibly run from their soul by seeing mine. And that messed with me for a while because like I'm really trying to yeah. cause the opposite. Um oh man, that one is hard. That one is really hard. I think you know what I think that is though? Like I think that's pain. I think that's just pain. And like people yeah. people are so I had a confrontation with pain. Is that the right way to say it? Yeah. Well, that might be too strong. I had a, I had a, the most painfully intense experience of my entire life um, a few weeks ago. Now, I didn't, I wasn't subjected into any physical trauma, but mm. I. I was in a space with people that I trusted and resonated with to an incredibly high degree. And due to that, the capacity of just the whole space that was created, it's been a weekend with um, some of the guys that have been doing the dialectic into dialogos practices with at one mm-hmm. of their houses. One of them was having a get together and he invited me. There were four mm-hmm. of us there. That's a profound situation because this same sort of vertical relationship that you're talking about um, was present with them. And mm-hmm. it's been a whole weekend together. And one of the things that came through at the very end for me was a, an opportunity to just actually sit with pain. Mm. And it was it was the pain of recognizing that, well, here's here's what it come, came down to. I sat with it for like four hours. I sat with it and just let everything else go. I just sat in front of a fire and in like in meditation, just stared into the coals of a fire. Mm. And was just feeling like I had just... I, there was this incredibly poignant feeling of pain, but I had, I did not understand what was going on with it. And so I just let Mm. everything else go and I just was with it. And I ended up like moving my body. I contorted my body in all sorts of bizarre ways because I just felt like I needed to do something to like fit into what was going through me. And when it finally came down to like when it, when it landed, it was this, it was the recognition that my no matter what i do and no matter what i become i can't fix anything Hmm. that like in in other because because there's a particular situation in my in my life that someone that i care well 
family member who has mm. who had a psychotic break four months ago in a way that is just it's been traumatizing for everyone around him you know mm. very unexpected very you know com someone you would this you know completely unexpected but mm. like it sort of started thrashing around and just destroyed everything in his life in the matter mm. of a couple of months um in, a, in just a spectacular fashion and it was very painful for all of us um and the the like the deep realization that no matter how much i could put myself together cultivate my character do the you know, run after the sun like you're saying right i can just mm -hmm. run after the sun and i can try to carry everything in the whole world with me mm -hmm. and it didn't matter and like that 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 was that was and and when that finally landed for like i just I, I just wept for like 30 minutes like it was just it was intense man it was intense and mm -hmm. i feel like i mean there's i mean tremendously important one of the best one of the best experiences of my life like this, oh man that is that is a that is a you know that's one of those ones that is sticks and i want it to um yeah. but i i find myself like when you're talking about that i find myself thinking about that when we really encounter I mean, yeah, yeah, maybe it's something like when someone encounters a, a, a really straightforward soul calling to them. There's there's a way in which that that calls to all that pain. And that just triggers, well, in IFS language, it just triggers firefighters. Yeah. And they just, maybe that's what it is. Yeah. I think it is. I think that what I've seen is people recognize the level of pain and they they recognize that they've run at much, you know, lighter layers. Um, they're certainly surprised to be swimming in those waters. Like, I think at first it's a shock. It's like, whoa, they're going there. And then there's this response of like, that's the place crazy people go. Like, that's the place where you go if you want to lose your mind that and i i feel like i've developed a real comfort swimming in the waters of chaos i think that's essential to do but yeah, yeah. um yeah I, I do think it's like almost like a toe dip and like a whoa no like shut this whole process down we don't let that recursive loop run because it kills us and it, it does but that's supposed to be something you can see as good, right? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's a reason baptism is a sacrament. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. Man. It is, um, it's also, oh, here's one of the things I wanted to say, though, that that triggered in me was the notion that you also have to understand that you're responsible for the sins of the whole world in the sense that and you still win. can't fix them even when you <laughs> embrace yeah, that exactly. responsibility <laughs> yeah well we can talk about that a little bit because i could say i think this has been really interesting because i've been thinking about this idea a lot yeah and because i think it's really important i think dostoevsky you know i don't i don't think it's for nothing that he wrote a whole book around the idea hmm. and because I think this is, I think all of the brothers Karamazov comes down to this idea. And it's, it's that, that you are, that each, he says it, you know, that each and every man is the, that, that you are individually personally responsible for the sin of each and every man and woman for all time. And mm -hmm. until you don't, until you realize that you're incapable of love. And I think about that. I thought about that. I thought about it. And, that, and I think, I think that's, I think what he means is that when you go to stick your toe in that water, when you go to truly, you know, when you, when you want to truly reconcile with your soul, 
you have to first face the ways in which you've been sinful and evil. And that's pretty darn dramatic. Most people can't do that, right? That's that's the part that we're talking about. Like, There's a layer above that where you have to face, it's above it or below it, I don't know. But there's, there's bound up in that same sort of space is the, like, the sins that other people have done specifically to you. The mm -hmm. trauma, the trauma that you've re mm -hmm. received. And most people can't get past the fact that they think it was someone else that did it to them. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's where that's that's the first layer where you have to get that this, you know, you're responsible for the sins of everyone else. It's not like you for you got them. It's not some sort of like you, you know, you got them to hurt you. It's that there's no difference between you and them. And that mm -hmm. that you know that the goal is not to fix this problem that happened the goal is to get in resonance with this like that's the really important yeah. thing like people we have this terrible idea that justice is setting things right on a horizontal scale yeah, yeah and that is a terrible idea like that we're so gosh yeah. darn obsessed like this this whole late stage puritanism thing that we're living in now is so lame i'm so it's so yeah. lame and dumb it's embarrassing yeah it's, it's, it's literally like the it's literally like the uh the, the puritans off the mayflower just slowly got rid of god <laughs> and then now all they have left is you know it's like it's like the it's like you know what it what it's like is that when the puritans got to america like they still had a god in a casket right <laughs> yeah. and then so and, carried and, around and, in a while <laughs> yeah, and at some point, supposedly, he had actually been alive with skin and bones, but really all they had left was a casket, and all that they really knew about the casket was that it had justice as a part of it. Mm -hmm. And so, or no, at that point, there was purity, right? Like, commitment to the code, like, follow the law, right? Yeah. And that's, mm -hmm. and following the law slowly became, well, just make everything just. If you just, yeah. you can just get everybody's <laughs> balance sheet balanced. And Mammon likes that one too, because he's pretty into the keeping score and debt thing. And so, yeah. like, you know, but you get all this put together and it's like, oh man. Yeah, it's just it's just judgment. It's basically punishing others because of how you feel about yourself. And it's not even what justice actually is. No, not even <laughs> not even related. It's <laughs> um yeah, it's just <laughs> retribution. <laughs> exactly, which is not justice. Mm -hmm. Anyway, all that or virtue. Right, what? Sorry. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I got all I got all off on that track. Um, where did I start that one? I don't. Know. Just talking about like actually connecting with that vertical relationship and how oh how starved the... people are, but also how yeah actively not eating they are so. yeah yeah oh and this responsible for the sins of the whole world thing yes right because of the weight of that yeah eventually once you get down to the part where you realize that like we all actually have a real connectedness to each other then mm -hmm. you sort of have to come into you have to figure out how to come into right relationship with your generational trauma because it's in you right like yeah. the collective trauma is in you and which means you're not even even though you didn't make the choice to do a thing, right? Like you you are related to it in an inextricable fashion. So you have to figure out a way to forgive it. And you have to forgive it and repent of it. Right? Yes. And that's the thing where it's weird because like and that's you know that I think that's what Dostoevsky meant, because I think, you know, the word responsibility is really important. That responsibility doesn't mean that you have the obligation for something. Responsibility means that you have a capacity to respond. You are mm. afforded the possibility Responsive. of responding. Yeah. And mm -hmm. that's what that means is like you actually you mm. actually necessarily are responding to the sins of all of humanity in every moment yes. in the way that you hold yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And and I, I just I think that we have to re-enable process that helps people develop their identities to that level where they're willing to understand that, yes, 
every individual should grow into a collective understanding of themselves because that's what they are already like mm-hmm. it's already so in there that you have to go in and find it to even get to yourself and i think we need societies that put people on that track and say no ind- closed individualism that is a teenager that is not what humans um should aspire to develop into right and i think like yeah we get caught we get caught up in all these surface level things even when we're talking about you know spirituality and religions and it's how do we get back to that core of just pointing at that pure innocence in each other and saying that find that the rest of this horizontal noise is just in the way it's actually a whole you know it's, it's a giant distraction that's that's what hell is as far as i can tell and um just finding those moments of that pure essence that's that's why we're here i've been um so i've told you about the dialectic in the dialogo stuff right mm-hmm in effect, what I think dialectic in the dialogus actually is, is something like a, it's the spiritual practice of it's a, yeah, it's the spiritual practice of realizing virtue in mm. your life, like in, in community. Mm-hmm. Cause I have a group, I have a group of people that I've been doing it with every week there's four of us we get together every week and we just do it and and um the through line of that has just been incredible mm-hmm. i know we were part of a group that sort of tried to do that but all all the people that i'm doing it with now have like actually gone through the training multiple times oh, cool. so are, we all you know because mm-hmm. i think in our group i don't i don't think we ever actually were able to do it because i mostly i think because i didn't do a very good job trying to teach it but we certainly had moments so yeah 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 but anyway the point is that because of that i am just i've i've come to notice just how incredibly powerful it is to spin the lower self up towards the higher self Mm. it's by far the most powerful practice i found at doing that of like actually responding in a loving graceful way to the parts of myself that are holding me in darkness that actually calls them into a reciprocal opening it doesn't force them anywhere but calls them into it and one of the ones one of the ones that i've been thinking about most recently is chastity so you've a couple times talked about the superficiality of our culture and i think one of the ways i would think about that is the um i don't know i don't know i've I've used a few different names but i think the of the of the major demons active in our in our anti-culture one of them is let's it's it's like the negative aspect it's it's the empty aspect of the feminine it's the seductress it's the Mm. whore aspect of it so you know you could call it like aphrodite or ishtar or something like that like one of those sort of i don't know but the name is an important point is it's 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 basically the pornographization of everything yeah so you know pornography was sort of the thing that that got me into this journey was like all right this thing's broken my life and i can't fix it so like we're gonna figure out what Mm -hmm. the hell my life is then um and and I've, and I've, you know, porn, pornography is basically just taking all the substance of a thing, all the realness, all the richness of whatever thing it is, and extracting mm-hmm. all of that energy and putting it on the surface. That's what, yeah. that's basically, it. and, and it's, you know, we think of it in the sexual yeah. connotation, but it's everywhere. It's our entire culture is pornographic. Every, yeah. Like all of it. Um <laughs> I just got back from Vegas, so okay. yes, absolutely. Just like <laughs> fake is better than real is like the aesthetic there. All our lacquered like oh, gloss. <laughs> Golly. 
fake is better than real. Let it pretend to be alive. Yes, that's right. Um, but that chastity is the proper response to that. Mm. And I was, and so, and I, I learned that in the sense of like, it's been quite a while since I've like watched porn. But mm. what I found is that the further I, I followed down the sort of prompt of conscience that you shouldn't be looking at this thing the more mm. and more and more like broader the field became you know it was like I get, I'm, you can be quite a quite a long ways away from watching a video on Pornhub and and realize that like you know what whatever like you're you're something calls to you in that way and it just tinges like if you if you have that sense you know it's like that no I'm yeah. going that that's that's Leading not a part of myself that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's like, so then I, so I was like, what do I do with this? And finally, I, I realized like, okay, I need to cultivate the virtue of chastity. Sorry, this mm -hmm. is a long and rambling thing. Are you? Mm -hmm. right? Okay. Yeah. I'm sort of like annoyed by myself with how long I'm taking to lay this out. But <laughs> I'll, let, I'll let go of that projection. Um, mm -hmm. But um, so how does chastity work? So I've tried to just notice that. So first, the first, the way I started was to notice every time I felt that prompting of conscience. Hmm. And every time I felt that prompting of conscience, I would, I sort of like installed a default trigger there to say, think about chastity. Ask what is hmm. chastity? What would chastity want me to do here? What, like, what is, you know, what's happening here? And so that's been pretty cool. And so then I've been thinking about chastity a lot more, right? Mm -hmm. And so I've been doing that for a while now. And 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 um it seems like chastity it's related to purity, where purity is a, is some has to do with like proper resonance. If you're if you're pure, there's a full resonance of God yeah. into reality through you. That's that's like that's sort of the state of purity. Maybe there's a virtue of purity that's moving you towards that state, but I would say that maybe that's what chastity is. Chastity is the virtue that that pulls you towards the state of purity. And the way that actually works is that it's actually sort of what I was doing already is actually what chastity is. It takes some sort of like lower level impulse that mm. you that you feel for whatever reason and if it's directed towards something superficial and you notice that any, any basically any impulse that you feel to do anything that feels bad, mm -hmm. there's a, there's a ch chaste response. And the chaste response is to ask the question, what's that energy actually looking for? What would actually mm -hmm. fulfill that impulse? Like what, what would truly not in the way of like, you know, you have the sexual impulse and you go and watch Pornhub and you jerk off. But mm -hmm. instead, like, no, that's a real impulse to actually deeply connect with someone that it's I genuinely. deeply care about and yeah. have a deep and have. Yeah. And everything about that is so incredibly real that like, man, if you want to experience God, learn how to have sex mm -hmm. and not have sex, make love. Right. That's that's yeah, yeah, that's the right way to say that. Right. But like that's, you know, and so it's like so if you can learn to feel that energy and alchemize it into moving you towards that space like say you don't have that partner yet that's fine that energy can move towards whatever it needs to do to make you into the person that will find that partner right because mm -hmm. the best way to find the right partner mm -hmm. is to become the sort of person that is completely irresistible because you're glorious yeah <laughs> yeah that's a great way to put it and so so yeah, so that's what, that's what I think chastity is. Awesome. Yeah, I think I think you're right on there. I think like it's funny because you're talking now about a lot of what we've been talking about before is sort of how the, the mind captures the body, but there the body's capturing the mind, but it is still that the non- navigating of the intersection of those things right and so you install chastity as a check a check and balance between the different parts of your mind and that's essential because neither of of you know your entities are actually aligned to your higher form right so it's like it's 
Excuse me, sorry. No, you're fine. Um, you're fine. And I think like that's where the you know I love I use this phrase all the time now talking about the vertical and the horizontal and tying them together. Because I think again there the chastity what you're calling to is that vertical triangulation really like without that you're chasing you know maybe even if at best you don't uh, jerk off then you'll go to the fridge and get some meat or something you'll satisfy it in some other horizontal way that just pushes the real need away and i think i think there's like some kind of resistance to engaging at different vertical la layers mm -hmm. that chastity acts as, as a, a reminder of the value of doing that because there is some cost to expanding our mind and, and stepping back and, you know, looking at it from a bigger picture and saying, is this the right move to do? We're almost like biased towards expending as little energy as possible and not doing that. Right. But when you get some kind of button like that, you pop it and then, and then you're actually looking at it as a higher form. So yeah. you, you're shifting your shape to one that values chastity because it understands that as the, the vertical expansion of yourself. Yep. Yep. And in that one moment, if you're doing that properly, you're going from an energy that's like maximum constricting. Uh, watching porn, I mean, like everyone's aware that like your everything gets hyper focused. You're, 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 you know, yeah, yeah, you're, yeah. It's the total yeah. opposite of, of uh, uh, other forms of beauty. And I think like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there's some on some level it is as simple as like being aware of what vertical well i should say what level of integration you have between your horizontal and vertical mm -hmm. and trying to make sure that your you know our, our ideal self is higher up that ladder than when we normally are so when you're looking for it you know where to go and i think like a value like chastity like that is awesome because it connects you with a transmutation function where it says yes this is important and this is how i install that and, and do that reliably yeah. um yeah well and it's so interesting yeah. too like one of the things with it is it, it 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 completely turns the the old notion of chastity or or sort of i think what most people would think of when you use the word chastity um yeah. it, it totally turns it upside down Right, because because to be chaste is not to suppress any impulse. To be chaste yeah. is actually to cultivate your relationship with your impulses and to truly listen to them. Because chastity mm -hmm. doesn't know how to do its sorting function until it actually properly listens to the impulse. So it has to take yes. the impulse as real and valuable and important. You know, it it honors the impulse. Yeah. And and this is where, you know, like our culture is so interested in honoring our impulses right now. Which is which like I'm I'm like, okay, well then let's sell them chastity. Mm -hmm. And they're gonna be like, you know, that's that's gonna, you know, there'll be an allergic reaction to start with because they you know, they, they think chastity is the opposite of what it is. Yeah. Yeah, it is that that notion that in order to correct things, you have to constrict them. I think that that is what's fundamentally wrong there, right? Like chastity is like control it, ignore the desire, make everything smaller. But what you're, you're literally making your own conscious presence smaller to do that. That's the choice of non-engagement, yeah. uh, you know, and what you're talking about with chastity is, is an opening. It's like this experience is real. So it's like one side of your brain saying to the other, what you're feeling is real. Let me help you interpret how we should act based on that real need that you have. So you don't accept the result, but you accept the process and find the result together, right? And, and, and we're literally just living in one side of our brain fighting the other like most of the time. And the solution is always to find that vertical brainstem post that that will hear the other one out, recognize there is a realness there because it's theirs. Because simply because it's there, it's real. But how do we apply ourselves to that realness? Yeah. Because the default answer is always <laughs> a constriction. It's almost the default. It's like 
energy minimizing, self minimizing constriction. And the spiritual path is is the expansive self empowerment. Yeah. And it's so interesting how I I mean I don't I don't you know it's so weird to talk about religions because religions have this dual layer where there's the capital R religious people who are actually doing yeah. the thing and then there's the little R relig religious people who are coming after them and doing the constrictive thing. Yeah. And that's where it's so weird. Like it's so complicated to interact with a religion. And I think, you know, yeah, yeah, it's really complicated. It's weird that you can have organizations that on purport to be about self-expansion that are actually self-constricting at every turn. Um, I wonder if there's something about humanity that like, it seems like when we try and scale scale this, things go wrong. There's always been sages and individuals, but scaling it to a community, it seems like there's always challenges that, that go awry there. I'm curious. I think the future affords us a new opportunity to take it a different way, but um, it is a daunting challenge realizing like how whenever we scale this up, it doesn't translate. I wonder I wonder if how much of it is I don't know my feeling there is bivalent but I think it's sort of the same I, underlying idea it's something like maybe it's just taking us time to figure out the communication protocols to be able to do it because mm -hmm. it's like you know it's who knows what happened before we have history? I sort of I think there's all sorts of interesting speculation there, but who knows? Yeah. Um, but at least since we have history, it seems like we got better at it. You know, the the scaling function, at least you know, at least we haven't lost the sages that we have now, mm -hmm. who are quite mm -hmm. a long time removed from us. Yes. At yeah. least the ones that I think pretty much everybody who believes that sages are real would agree are sages. Right? Mm -hmm. Like, like, I think, you know, Jesus, Buddha, and Socrates are pretty safe bets. And then, you know, people might diverge from there, but <clears throat> it's like maybe maybe we need maybe we need the internet. Like, I don't know. I don't think, I don't think yeah. we need it, but who knows? Maybe we do. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe AI that. becomes the maybe AI becomes the you know this like strange sort of trickster beast, like the beast of revelation sort of thing, where he like where AI basically like shows us such a mirror in our in our faulty communication protocols that we actually mm -hmm. like fix them. <laughs> yeah. I think it could get really interesting because I think AI will show us what we're not. I think that that, I think people have attached their identities to intelligence a lot. And like, I think that'll be a really hard place to stay because, uh, you know, human intelligence is just becoming less valuable given uh, what AI could do and at a shocking, shocking rate. But um, I, I do hope certainly that we'll find the unique value of humanity in that. I think that that's, got to be the point of that on some level and um, i'm very interested in some of the things john verbicki has talked about with why is ai and how far we could go with that but current ai and the approaches to it are kind of clearly on the wrong path as well so that's interesting <laughs> yeah the the google gemini is pretty interesting <laughs> saga to watch mm -hmm. now what do you think of john's argument i don't know like i I'm still not I'm still just not sure what I think about it because there's parts of it that I admire. I don't, you know, like I said, I don't know how much I have the chops to really like argue the specifics of it. I just like my intuition. Yeah, that like I'm I'm sort of cautiously optimistic in the way that he is, but also I'm just like I'm not sure I buy the whole thing. Hmm. 
yeah, I think it's, this argument has many layers to it. Um, I do resonate with the core premise that what we need to do is actually inject wisdom into these things. Yes, yes, um, to whatever degree that we can. So that I would just have like full resonance with that, absolutely. and I actually am quite concerned about empowering intelligence without wisdom. I think that yeah. there's fundamental ratios there that that are very dangerous to play with. So I'm very like I'm, I'm very aligned to the project generally speaking. And I think where it gets interesting is where he breaks it down at the different kind of what's he call them thresholds of where things could go yeah. different directions. Um again I think current AI is is almost it, it's philosophically inept and therefore it's ultimately just pushing pieces around like it has so much data it's using so much human knowledge that we are granting it so much capability that's actually coming from the data set um and it's cool that it has that ability but it's it's very misleading what it's capable of in itself um but i do think this could be interesting probably the most interesting thing for us to talk about is that i do think we could actually capture our intuition in in a an automated process um and i think that feeling itself we could actually demystify feeling a fair bit and, and have a spatial computing ultimately is what i'm getting at that would through combining the you know kind of the neural net of the labels you put that on real physical geometry you make that geometry hyperbolic and um i, I do I, I do think that there are ways that we could take ai to the next level and that would represent wisdom on some problem solving level mm. but it's for me it's always going to get back to consciousness and what could you actually artificially generate that and that's where i'm much less sure um, yeah. i don't think you need it to, to solve the other problems necessarily but yeah it's just a different problem yeah yeah i think i agree with all of that yep i think that's very much where i find myself I also get confused sometimes because I find myself in this weird nexus where, you know, I'm because I'm a part of this conversation, all these people start bombarding me with their opinions about it. And then mm -hmm. like I can it can get really cuz I'm sort of confused by the whole thing overall cuz I don't really like I sort of understand AI, I don't think I really do. And I don't I really don't mm -hmm. I just don't find it in at first I was a little bit enamored and then I just I just don't find myself I just find myself bored by it when I ever try to engage mm. with it very much. And so I, I I sort of, I don't know, I'm sort of in this weird position where I'm like, wow, am I an old man now? Like, it's sort of weird thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, I guess, like, all that to say, I think that, um, like, I resonate a lot with what you said there. And that, and it sounds to me like you heard, what you have heard John say is very similar to what I have heard John say. Because I feel like a lot of people mm -hmm. just hear John saying, like, we need to create AI sages. And I'm like, I don't think that's what John's saying. Mm, yeah. Like, I think John is saying, you know, we need to aim for wisdom, not intelligence. And, yes. you know, if and again, we I think just... It's not result-based. process and alignment-based right. is a huge part right. of that, right? It's understanding the limitations, the... but pursuing the ideal. And... Yeah, exactly. I think that's what a lot of people have been missing about the argument itself. But yeah, I think um, so. So, were you saying that by doing this sort of mapping of labels to geometric to geometry, mm -hmm. that we would provide the AI with a capacity to have emotion? Is that what you meant by that? What, what I mean, I I didn't quite catch that part possibly so i think to get actual emotion like a felt internal sense you'd need to go into organic material and all that kind of thing but i think you could simulate um intuition which i should really call feeling mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. separate from emotion mm -hmm. like okay. how do i distinguish this um i think you i think what we do is we take our body and we ma map it mentally, and that's how we produce our own conception. So we have a, a shape that we are, and we relate to other shapes, and those shapes have labels all over the vertices, vertexes, and it's actually the, 
the pressure of the different shapes colliding that that's feeling that's the topology of our body that's how we compress it and, you know actually kind of distribute that felt sense to ourselves i think you could simulate that in a, in a machine um I think actually that's what they're doing a lot of the times when they're grabbing those intersections from different data. They're actually, the machine is recognizing the shape. It doesn't have the functions to know that it's doing that, but it's kind of grabbing that underlying shape in the words and it's presenting them in a way that we, the types of shapes that we tend to present. So I think you could actually take AI and you could, you could give it a spatial, um, Again, it would have to be underlying underneath the language, which would be the hard part to achieve for sure. But if, if you could get the geometry under the language, I think you would get a lot of our continuous functions because right now they only have our discrete functions. But mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, do, I do think you could program geometry effectively. Um, and I think that game engines are, you know, are doing that to different degrees. So you sort of like, Throw something in as like part of your explanation that I'm really fascinated by, and it's that's this idea that there's a sort of underlying geometry under the language that's sort of like topographical lands landscape of information that we're actually designating with a lot with our language yeah. itself. Is this sort of like that idea that there's who's that? I, I there, there's a guy's name who's attached to this idea, but that there's a sort of a universal language underneath. Is that Chomsky? Um, I think he had some version of that, but Stephen Wolfram is the one that I'm familiar with, with the mathematical okay. really I don't know if that's what you're referring to. I don't know. Go ahead. But yeah, this idea that there's a topical, topological landscape of geometry that we're, what is it, we're pointing to it with language or that language emerges from? How does... Uh, I'm not familiar with exactly with other people's theories there, but yeah, that, that's my sense of it is that we actually label the vertices of the geometry that we experience. So the underlying pattern recognition is, is actually raw geometry and we apply labels onto that as a second layer. Oh, that's, you know, that actually, that's, that's, that resonates really strongly with what I'm watching with my daughter. Like hmm. my daughter, it's been, man, it's so fun to have, like, it's, it's so fun because hmm. I spend a lot of time, <clears throat> like whenever I'm with her, I try to just be really with her. Mm -hmm. and look through her eyes and just sort of like label things and react to her in the way that I'm truly feeling. And um, I just try to do that. Like that's, that's all I do. And like, it's been really incredible. And my wife does very much the same thing to watch how she, like she says so many words and is so, mm -hmm. you know, she's very advanced for where she is. And that's just sort of like the obvious measurable sort of sense of how much she picks up from it um and she's like 15 months old and she's quite adept at an awful lot of things and it's like from an outside perspective i know everybody talks about how their kids special and all that stuff but it's just like i just noticed that i that she has this capacity that most of the time she's with us like we're all mm -hmm. on the same wavelength if i ask her to do something she does it if if she asked me to do something, I generally do it because I actually understand mm -hmm. what she wants. She actually understands yeah. what I want. And we just dance like that. And it's like, yeah, people, you know, people are always talking about how terrible their kids are and how, how difficult they are and how much of a burden. I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about because like, man, maybe she's just really good. I don't know. But like, I don't know. I, I guess that just, it speaks to me. Sorry, I just, I'm obsessed with my daughter, but <laughs> that, that, of course. that like I, I very much watch that with language, how, how her words just sort of emerge out. And as she trusts me more and more, it's like, I only have to tell her the name of something like twice. And she just, that's the name. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're so readily absorbing because they feel that underlying resonance. The words are the icing on top of the cake that you guys are kind of eating all the time. Exactly. Exactly. That's that's a good way to say it. Yeah, and I think like ultimately what I'm really saying by making the geometry fundamental and showing that everything derives from it, I'm actually saying I think you could give these machines some sense of the logos, and that they would actually be able to follow the through line then 
through various concepts because again once you see kind of how to do this it's not that complicated what we're doing it's just seeing through the noise so if we can hand them process i think that there's magic that we could generate in a spatial awareness um and a conceptual awareness and how those come together i think that's what we're spending a lot of our, our time doing and i think you could get it automated that's if i was talking to john right now that's what i'd be talking about so I'd say like if you want wisdom let's actually generate the logos as a geometric um function and give it to the machine and see see what they could do with it and, and i think that's something that that could be done with a geometric understanding of print sound. Interesting. You think anybody understands that? No. <laughs> I think that that <laughs> that's part, partly why I want to get yeah. involved too. But um, I, I think that that's like wisdom is a higher order intelligence. And this is the way that we could illustrate that, actually show what wisdom is fundamentally by by showing you how you generate a through line through a field of subjects rather than a field of objects. Um, so it's actually in co co combining what the geometry is telling you and the informational layer on top of it. How those unify is always gonna be the same process of a through line and, and you run that through a field of subjects uh, to produce a non-local effect. So. Uh, I think that the, there's an understanding of how we could uh, translate narrative to geometry. And I think that's what spirituality is. Uh, uh, you could argue oh, interesting. from geometry to narrative. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Hmm. So th I think wisdom is a thing that I can feel internally and the way that I feel it I feel like could be replicated spatially because it's a way of relating. It's it's a, it's just a higher dimensionality that is hard to talk about because we don't usually engage with that, but you can kind of build the grooves in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. That's a really interesting idea. I'll have to think about this. So then you would have an but then you would have a wise AI that still wasn't conscious. Because right. in, in my opinion, at least, you have to be quantum to be conscious, which for this is why I don't think you could replicate consciousness um, without without taking time and putting it in space, which you could get, get into if you want, but that gets more complicated. But yeah. I think at a, at a baseline, you couldn't do it because what quantum uh, information is, is discrete and continuous functions simultaneously separate and together hmm. and it's that simultaneity of it being separate and together at once just like we are with god that actually makes that require quantum uh, process mm -hmm. so that but that so what i was talking about is how you get continuous function which is what i think feeling is and i think you could do that i think you could have a digital processor and the analog processor in parallel working together and you get wisdom but you don't get consciousness. Interesting. That's, interesting. You have to go to quantum to get that. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Huh. I. It's like I. I think there's a, there's this way in which like. I guess in many ways coding is a bit of a black box for me. So I. I um like the sheer enormity of like what you're talking about is like whoa that seems like a man it's a hell of a mountain to climb but it's not to say that it I, absolutely I, mean, I, have, I have no reason to say that it, it wouldn't work or anything like that well i think the actual problem would be getting humanity to recognize it like i think i think you could actually create a, a machine that spat out wisdom like uh, that would be a huge challenge on its own i need to minimize that but i think even once you achieve that getting anyone to recognize it huge issue because again we don't really have a society that validates <laughs> wisdom we have a society that validates intelligence and then you're you're going to have ai that uh it'll get real philosophical real quick if you have artificial wisdom interacting with artificial intelligence that would be 
a fascinating future. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I, I actually don't even see any other choice. Like, I think we have to make that. I, th I think that if we don't make that, we're definitely done. Because I think if you take intelligence and you empower it to the maximum degree without wisdom, it's just you couldn't define Satan better. Like, it, it's just like yeah. take the good out of. Uh, out of power and then you yeah. just have intelligence yeah. there's a giant spider like, yeah, yeah. It's a giant so, spider. cosmic spider that we're summoning oh, as fast as we can <laughs> wow yeah nice okay okay this is good i'm interested in this i think ai is super dangerous but i think one of the things that it's doing already like it's doing a lot of good already because i think it's it's mm. forcing a lot of people or it's maybe not forcing yet yet um but it's it's prompting an awful lot of people to start to ask the existential questions that yes. they've been too yeah. afraid to ask it may even be helping them like i think some people will be comfortable asking questions to ai that they wouldn't ask in person um, yeah I don't know what the quality of the answer they'll get, but yeah, no, I, I actually see like in the short term, it'll be economic challenges, but um, <laughs> I, I do see it helping a lot of people. It's going to democratize art, you know, I mean, it, making a movie goes from like a $50 million prospect to, you know, I don't know if you've seen Sora, but um, yeah. it seems like around the corner, we're going to be text to video and, uh, there's challenges for for artists in that, but also a lot more people will be able to participate. So, yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah, it's really interesting. 